2 on humans as organisms has five sections. So let's start with the first one on circulation. The heart and blood vessels provide a root system around the body, but it is the actual blood which transports oxygen, food and hormones to parts of the body that need them, and waste products are carried away. These substances join and leave the blood at thin-walled blood vessels called capillaries. You can see the blood moving through this network of tiny vessels. The capillary tube is only one cell thick and easily allows gas exchange to take place. Oxygen, food and hormones leave the blood here and carbon dioxide and other waste products join the blood ready to be carried away. Blood is a transport medium which carries food, oxygen and hormones to the parts of the body that need them. Blood also carries waste products away, such as carbon dioxide. Capillaries are thin-walled blood vessels that provide the place for the exchange of substances. These last key points about blood are really important. If you weren't quite sure about the function of blood and the structure of capillaries, why not go back over the material in this section? Or, if you prefer, you could try out the book or the website. The subject of reproduction in humans is quite complex, so we have split it up into two sections with several bite-sized chunks, so you can concentrate on one bit of it at a time. First, adolescence and the menstrual cycle. When a human's reproductive organs become mature and physically the person changes from a child into an adult, this period of time is called puberty. Boys usually start to produce sperm between the ages of 12 and 16. Girls start to release eggs, on average, between the ages of 11 and 15. During adolescence, which follows puberty, there are many other changes that happen to our bodies, both physical and emotional. And these changes are caused by very small amounts of very powerful chemical substances called hormones. In the next clips, we're going to run through many of the changes that happen to both girls and boys. So why not make a note of all of the ones that you notice? So first, the key changes that happen to boys. At puberty, testes start to produce sperm. The secondary sexual characteristics then develop. The muscles and penis grow bigger. The voice becomes much deeper. And pubic, facial and underarm hair grow. And now the changes that happen to girls. At puberty, the ovaries start to release eggs once a month. The secondary sexual characteristics that follow are that the breasts start to develop, the hips get broader, and pubic and underarm hair grow. You also need to be able to sketch and label both the male and female reproductive system. In the male sketch, you need to remember the penis, testis, sperm duct, and urethra. And in the female reproductive system, make sure you label the ovary, fallopian tube, uterus and vagina. And remember, always use a pencil and a ruler for labelling diagrams. Why not have a go and practice drawing them? Now, let's look at an important part of the human reproductive process, the menstrual cycle. Between about the ages of 11 to 50, a woman is fertile. This means that each month an egg is released from one of the two ovaries. When this happens, the lining of the uterus thickens with a large supply of blood to receive an egg. If the egg is not fertilized, the lining of the uterus breaks down and passes out of the vagina. This monthly bleed occurs on average every 28 days and is what we call the menstrual cycle. So, just to recap, the key points are In reproductive females, the menstrual cycle is where the uterus lining breaks down every month if an egg isn't fertilised. Ovulation occurs when an egg is released from one of the two ovaries. If sexual intercourse takes place and the egg is fertilized, then the lining of the uterus stays intact. It doesn't break down. The blood supply to the lining increases ready for a fertilized egg. Fertilization is the stage of reproduction that we're going to look at next.
If intercourse takes place, fertilization may occur. The sperm released from the penis swim along the fallopian tube. There, they may meet an egg. So fertilization is when one single sperm fuses with the larger egg. Fertilization is the point where one sperm embeds into the large egg and successfully fuses. Now the uterus wall remains intact and the fertilized egg cell starts dividing and embeds itself into the uterus lining. For your test, it's really important that you know the order of events in reproduction well. So the sequence of events goes like this. Ovulation, and then if intercourse occurs, fertilization. That's the fusion of the sperm and egg taking place. Then cell division to form a ball of cells, and after that, implantation into the thickened uterus lining. Let's look more closely at what happens after fertilization has occurred. And we find the embryo, focus on it, set the video recorder going so that we have one shot every two seconds and we leave the embryo there for about a week. What you start off with is a fertilized egg which is a large cell and this cell will divide about once every day initially and these cells carry on dividing until there are about eight or sixteen cells about three days after the one cell stage and then finally it gets to the stage where it wants to hatch out of the jelly coating that has been protecting it during earlier development and then it's ready to implant in the lining of the womb we're going to move on to look at how the growing fetus develops and the importance of the placenta. After about nine weeks, the limbs are visible and the embryo becomes a fetus. The heart needs to be powerful enough to pump blood not only around the embryo's body, but out to the lining of the womb. This particular blood vessel extends from the embryo to a remarkable structure, the yolk sac. Although there's no yolk inside, the embryos of other animals from which we have evolved are nourished by food stored in the yolk sac. Human embryos, however, obtain their food by way of the placenta. Blood vessels from the embryo spread out across the lining of the womb. Here, the placenta develops to provide the interchange of food, oxygen and other substances between the mother's blood and that of her growing baby. The arteries and veins join to form the major vessels of the umbilical cord, the lifeline between mother and baby. The placenta brings the fetal blood into close contact with the mother's blood, but the two don't mix. The blood passes to the fetus via the umbilical cord. The placenta also acts as a barrier to some harmful substances, such as pathogens and some drugs. What important role does the placenta play? That's an interesting one. The placenta grows and develops alongside the fetus, but what's its special job? There are two main points. Why not stop the tape and jot them down, or if you prefer, you can move straight on to the answer. So, what important role does the placenta play? Your answer should include two points. One, the placenta acts as an exchange place for oxygen and food and waste products. And your second point should mention that the placenta protects the growing fetus and acts as a barrier to some harmful substances and microorganisms. This brings us to the end of reproduction. But before we leave these two sections, make sure you're familiar with all the key points. If you're not sure, you could rewind the tape and go through them again. Don't forget the book and the website. And now here are a few top tips that might help you as well. A good tip for when you're trying to learn the systems in the human body is to pick one system per week. Learn it, learn it again, 
and then attempt to explain how, for example, the digestive system works to your mum or your baby brother. If they understand it, maybe you do. This man of 53 who smoked himself to death 20 years too soon because he's been smoking and he developed a cough and produced some blood and went to his doctor who did a chest x-ray and showed indeed there was a tumour. In two months he's dead. Although nicotine is poisonous, you can't get enough from smoking to kill you. There are many other chemicals in cigarette smoke and they are grouped together as tar. Each one of these flasks contains the dissolved tar from just one cigarette. This is an example of tar. This thick, black, treacly substance has over 4,000 chemicals in it. We know that it causes cancer. We know that it causes a narrowing of the airways into the lungs. We know that it causes an increase in mucus production. And we certainly know that it damages the little hairs that line the lungs, which help to protect the lungs from dirt and diseases. We've seen from the clip that different chemicals produced by smoking have long-term effects on health. Let's just check through the key points. Tar contains chemicals that cause lung cancer. Nicotine, another product of smoking, causes high blood pressure and damages arteries. Carbon monoxide reduces the amount of oxygen carried by the blood. And finally, smoking causes damage to the alveoli, the air sacs in the lungs. Besides the effects of smoking, you also need to know about the effects of alcohol and other harmful substances. As we run through the list, why not make a note of them and how they affect the body? Any drug, if abused, can cause physical damage to our bodies, even if it was intended as a medicine. Drugs can also cause personal and social problems. We've just seen the side effects caused by smoking. Now, let's look at alcohol. Large quantities of alcohol will slow down the drinker's brain, making them clumsy and slow to react. Continued abuse over a long period will result in damage to the liver and the brain. Next, solvents. Solvents inhaled, such as glues and paints, produce hallucination sensations and cause permanent damage to the lungs, brain, kidneys and liver. Then other drugs such as heroin, cocaine and ecstasy. They can have rapid effects on health and large doses can cause death. Now you don't need to know a lot of detail about this subject, but you do need to know some of the effects these drugs have. So if you're not sure of the facts, why not rewind and go through them again? Every day, life exposes us to other threats to our health, and one of the other major causes of ill health is microorganisms. Not all microorganisms are bad news, but the ones that are are called pathogens, and there are two main types, bacteria and viruses. In reality, viruses are 100 to 1,000 times smaller than bacteria. And even with bacteria, if we put 1,000 of them end to end, they would only cover one millimetre. So let's look at bacteria first. Bacteria are single-celled microorganisms. They vary in shape and have no distinct nucleus, but their genetic material is within their cell walls. They can reproduce rapidly and can give out poisons or toxins. Most bacteria are killed by antibiotics. Typical bacterial diseases are tetanus, cholera and tuberculosis, and food poisoning is very common. The second type of microorganism is the virus. The common cold, flu or measles are all caused by viruses, and the main difference between a virus and a bacterium is that the virus does not have a cell wall, only a protein coat surrounding a few genes. For viruses to live and grow, they have to take possession of a living cell. And once they are inside the cell, this is where they set about their destruction and reproduce rapidly. They are completely unharmed by antibiotics, which only work with bacteria. But it is possible to use vaccines for some viruses. Again, like your knowledge of drugs, you don't need to know a lot of in-depth knowledge about bacteria and viruses at this stage. 
but it is good to know some of their characteristics and, importantly, the differences between them. Let's check through them again. So the main differences between bacteria and viruses are that bacteria have a cell wall and viruses only have a protein coat and have to invade an organism's cell to reproduce. And secondly, bacteria are killed by antibiotics and viruses are not affected. Brilliant! You have completed humans as organisms. You can check through again if you're not completely sure of any of the topics. And if you want to change, why not try the website for some more interactive questions? And don't forget the book either. This is a good place to take a break, but whatever you do, it's your choice.